This is Michael Woodward, and this is Season 2, Episode 77 of the Jumble Think Podcast. T-10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1... Welcome to the Jumble Think Podcast, where we interview amazing entrepreneurs about their journey of turning dreams and ideas into reality. Along the way, we'll give you some tips on how you can turn your own dreams and ideas into reality, too. Our guest on today's episode is Mark Geiger. More about Mark in a moment. If you haven't already, I want to encourage you, wherever you like to listen to your podcast, head on over there and click that subscribe button. If you're new to the podcasting world, Here's a quick tip. Go to jumblethink.com slash iTunes or jumblethink.com slash Spotify. It will take you right to the app where you can click that subscribe button and check out the podcast. While you're there, make sure to drop us a rating and review. Now let's jump into today's episode. Hey there, welcome to the Jumble Think Podcast. My name is Michael Woodward. I am your host. We have an episode I'm super excited about. We'll get into that more in a moment. Before that, we want to thank today's sponsor, Opportunity in China. Here's a little bit more about what they're doing. At the dawn of the 19th century, forward-thinking people moved to the commercial centers of Europe. Moving into the 20th century, America welcomed millions into the land of freedom and opportunity. It is now the 21st century. Many of the successes and fortunes of our generations will be made in China. To learn how you can seize opportunity in China, follow the Opportunity in China podcast. The Opportunity in China podcast is available anywhere podcasts are streamed, or you can visit our website at opportunityinchina.com. So today on the podcast, our guest is Mark Geiger. I am so excited to have him on the podcast. I've been a big fan of what he's doing for several years. Years ago, I met him at a Luthier show, which is a show where a lot of guitar makers and other stringed instrument makers show up. They show what they're making, and you get to meet them, play their instruments, and check out all the cool stuff that they're innovating on. And so I met Mark there, super impressed with his guitars and what he was building. As I got to talk to him and get to know him more, I learned that not only was he a luthier and making really, really, really cool guitars, but he also had spent years working at Paramount, uh, building sets for Hollywood and uh, working on shows, doing really, really cool stuff. This is a super fun interview. I think you're going to love it. And let's get started with the conversation with Mark Geiger, the creator behind Geiger Guitars. Our guest today is Mark Geiger. He is the luthier behind Geiger Guitars, doing really cool stuff and teaching many others how to build uh, beautiful guitars too. Before he was uh, doing luthery uh, full time, he was a foreman at a construction, well, a set construction portion of Paramount Pictures working for movies. Uh, he's been doing guitar making and so much more since then. Uh, I love following him along on Facebook. He was just recently at a car show where they were racing Porsche tractors, if I remember correctly, sure. and stuff like that. So, Mark, thanks so much for taking time and being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Now, I was just sharing here that you've done a lot of different things in your journey, a lot of it around construction and building and and making things. Where did that passion for building start? Well, I think most of that comes from my dad. He was a, a, into construction for quite a while, and he's had a lot of different careers. So I think probably the genes came from there, and I've always been interested in building things. If I wasn't building guitars, it would be something else. Wow. Uh, and, and your story is kind of fun because you, uh, like so many luthiers of uh, the 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, you were a a kid who wanted a guitar, couldn't afford it, said, maybe I can build this on my own. Tell us that story. Well, it was actually, I, I think it was my um, senior year in high school, and I wanted a Les Paul. And yeah. uh, there was one at a local shop, and it was, I saved up all summer for it. And when I got there, they had just sold it. Wow. So I thought, well, let's try building one. Um, and, you know, I caught a lot of grief along the way. And it certainly wasn't a museum piece, but it did play. <laughs> and uh, I, I got another uh, friend of mine who was a phenomenal guitar player 
in a local band, and he liked it enough to commission me to do one for him. And so that's a, how, how it got, got started. Wow. So it was out of just kind of life situations. You kind of saw a problem, came up with a solution uh, and and solved it. You obviously are now doing Luthery and teaching, which for some people, they might not know what that is. Tell us what Luthery is and what what your job is, what you do. Well, it, it Luthery is the building of stringed instruments. Okay. So literally it started from lutes. Um, you can even call violin makers luthiers. Uh, I mean, I specialize in acoustic and electric guitars, but I also do, I've done dulcimers and uh, uh, mandolin, um, what else, banjo and a couple of ukuleles. So it kind of spans the the gamut of any kind of stringed instrument. And um, what I basically do are acoustic instruments with some electrics on the side. Okay. And I've played your instruments. Uh, I was just uh, reminiscing about a story of when I first met you. I remember it was a uh, Healdsburg guitar show, and uh, I was early in the stage. I'm still early in the stage. I'm, I'm 50% through, and that must have been like 10 years ago, building my first acoustic guitar. Uh, I just need to uh, just step up and go take your course, get from the East Coast out there to see you and, and have you hold me to the fire. But uh, you... I remember sitting down and a lot of the guitar makers back in the, the 10 years ago, uh, they made uh, beautiful guitars. You make incredibly beautiful guitars. And, and what drew me to you was the comfort of the neck playing, the, the, the neck shape and everything that you had done. And I just sat there for about an hour just playing their various guitars. I think you had like five or six sitting there. Yeah. And uh, it was a lot of fun. It was also one of the first times I think I had seen uh, and heard about baritone guitars, which was uh, kind of opened my eyes to to innovation. So for you, when you're approaching what you do, when you're approaching building, uh, how are you thinking about the process of building and and how you build a guitar? Well, what I like to do, I've never wanted to approach it from a corporate level. I never wanted to be Bob Taylor or Paul Reed, some yeah. of these guys who are, are, are big commercial builders. And so what I try to do is try to do something different every time and not repeat myself. And okay. that sort of keeps the inspiration going. If I was building the same instrument over and over and over again, I probably still wouldn't be building. Wow. Wow, that's really, really cool. Okay, so... I want to go back a little bit uh, in this first segment and go back to you end up working at Paramount on the construction sites, which is a cool thing to to be able to say. Uh, Not many people that I know have said, hey, I worked at Paramount building sets. Uh, Tell us a little bit about that journey of how you got into that space and doing that. Well, I I always wanted to uh, um, work in film and in I believe it was about 85, I applied to Ithaca College for their film program. And so I, I have a Bachelor of Science in, in, in film. And that's always intrigued me. So when I went out to Los Angeles with a couple of friends of mine, you know, of course you want to be the next Steven Spielberg or whatever. <laughs> right. And, 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 and of course you have to eat. And my background was in construction and I talked to a guy who said, you should call so-and-so. They're going to be doing a, a, a film that's non-union called The Adams Family, and they're probably going to go union. Wow. And so I got on the project, and I worked on that for about six months. And after the first month, um, we got grandfathered into the union, and after I took my tests and paid my dues, that's how I, how I got into that. And it, it was good for paying the bills, and it was yeah. very – it was very interesting. We do everything from like w- once I started working for Paramount proper, cause a lot of it was freelance before that. Um, right. And once I got into that, we could do all sorts of really oddball things. I remember one of the things I did, we were doing naked gun 33 and a third and Priscilla Presley was supposed to be on this Mack truck and she's tiny. So we're supposed to have this like outrageous, you know, truck and I had to build a Mack truck steering wheel that was three times bigger than a real Mack truck steering wheel. 
<laughs> so you're doing stuff like that. And, and then, of course, there's all the Star Trek projects and everything on Star Trek. And there's no right angles. And, and so that was a lot of fun. So you do a lot of interesting things. And all these things sort of helped in, in the Luthery part of it, too, because yeah. it's problem solving. Yeah. Yeah. I love that because uh, it seems like the more I talk to you, the more I realize that one of your passions is being able to use your brain and and process problems and come up with solutions, whereas some other people, they just like the routine of doing the same thing over and over again. It just sounds like part of your story is you love being able to see a problem, find a unique solution, and solve it in a creative way. Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of fun. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about the pivot. Uh, you spent years working at Paramount. All of a sudden, uh, well, probably not all of a sudden, it was a journey for you, I'm sure. You decide, hey, I'm going to give it a shot and go full time and just do guitar making uh, and make that my career. Well, I, I think you reach a certain point. Um, I was at a level where I was foreman and... I didn't really want to go much higher than that. Um, yeah. You get into the politics. I was already getting into the politics. Plus, you get older, and some of these uh, films we'd work on, say we were working on a, a, a film that we may be working three months it, with no days off, 12 hours a day. So it would be yeah. seven days a week, and it's kind of a young man's game. So you get older, and stuff like that becomes a lot tougher to do. Wow. Well, wow. okay. So we always end this first segment with a couple of questions that we ask everyone. So the first one is, uh, how are you finding purpose in what you do, uh, whether it's teaching what you teach on guitar making or whether it's actually building? How are you finding purpose in that? Well, I, I like both of them. I like building because there are three factors that have to have to uh, um, it has to play well for one thing. It yeah. has to sound good, and then on the next level, it has to be able to withstand a certain amount of abuse for quite a few years. And so I like the idea of, um, I, I liken it to, to like a Ferrari. You're talking about a really um, build that is just on the level of collapsing, but not. <laughs> so you're trying to maintain that, that sort of hyper, um, I, I don't know how you'd say it, but um, th this ability to have this great sound but you want to be able to have it so that it's going to be there for a hundred years. Yeah. So that's the part that's fun. And on the teaching level, I've always sort of been interested in it. And I've been doing that for about 10 years. And the thing I like about that is we start out with a box of wood and say, for instance, an acoustic class is about two weeks. It's two weeks. Yeah. And we're working eight hours for six days a week. And the beauty of that is I watch these guys look at this box of wood and it literally is a box of wood there's no pre you know <laughs> built parts in it and and i watch them and their eyes are like going oh my god what have i gotten myself into and you watch that transition from that beginning to the last day when they're stringing this up and playing it and that that just marvelous look on their face that like i built this because <laughs> i think part of the problem with that I see actually um, nowadays, it's from an old man, I guess it's perspective, but nobody builds anything. Yeah. Um, and, and that's nothing against somebody who makes their living um, mentally. But I also think that there's this aspect that you have to sort of get your hands dirty. Um, you got to have the same sort of energy in your hands as you do in your head. And so if that makes any sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, especially with being a younger generation guy. I mean, I'm in, a, I'm, a, I'm 37, so I'm not super young, you're, but you're I'm, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm in the middle of that generational shift and mindset uh, change. And it's um, one of the things I'm excited about is I'm seeing more and more younger guys saying, yeah, maybe I could do something that is a little bit more physical, sure. whether it's, so, you know, coffee roasting, that's blowing up real big everywhere. And uh, there's a lot of like younger luthiers coming out really saying, hey, I, I think this is something that I can do. And so it's really cool to see uh, what you're able to do with teaching uh, people who maybe haven't ma been able to make something or or just didn't think they could do it. Sometimes I, I find that the people who have no experience are the ones who do the best job because they listen to what you're trying to do instead of having these preconceived notions and stuff. So, so good. So good. Now, what is one challenge you're currently working to overcome in your business? 
I think the the main thing I, I have a, a I have to overcome is I don't want to get stagnant. And when I find myself thinking, well, I'm doing the same similar thing, it may not be the same thing. And so what I do is I try to keep these projects going. I just finished one that I started about six or seven years ago and just kind of puttered with. And it's an Art Nouveau uh, style carved electric guitar with through carvings and all this, you know, which took me a while to do. And it was actually in a, um, a gallery uh, exhibit a couple of months ago in Tracy, California. That's the kind of stuff that sort of motivates you to like keep going because you're trying to push your own boundaries. <clears throat> Somebody may not want to pay for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it, sometimes you've got to bounce that of like what's business sense and what's sometimes a growth expanse uh, space where you're growing and evolving as a, as a builder or as a, a maker in that space. It, for you, you've uh, just wrapped up this kind of longer project where you've been puttering over it for the last several years. What, what's maybe a next big goal you have for your business or for what you want to do? Well, um, that's funny you should say that. Um, I'm kind of at a crossroads right now where I'm trying to decide w which direction I'm going to go, whether I'm going to sort of start winding down actually because of the fact – and this has nothing to do with the creative process. It has more to do with insurance and stuff like that. I'm finding it harder and harder to find insurance companies that will insure me to do the building classes and stuff like that. So wow. that's one of those things that's very tough and that's a logistical issue. It's kind of like next year I've got to find another carrier. So wow. I'll be able to do that. So that's probably my biggest challenge right now. Very, very cool. We'll be back with Mark Geiger and our second segment where we go a little bit deeper into some of these topics. <laughs> Today's episode is sponsored by Opportunity in China. Have you been looking for a way to change your career or social prospects? Do you see the world around you changing and haven't quite figured out what path to take? You're not alone in seeking opportunity. Visit opportunityinchina.com for access to scholarships to attend university in China, or if you have a bachelor's degree already, opportunityinchina.com provides access to jobs in the educational sector all across China. Working in China is not only often well-paid, but will place you among one-fifth of the world's population, boosting your social network, bringing you more deeply into the story of globalization, and opening doors you never knew existed. So seize your opportunity now. Visit their website for more information at opportunityinchina.com. By the way, they have a great podcast. You should go check it out. Go search for Opportunity in China on your favorite app or place to listen to podcasts. The heartbeat of JumbleThink is to help you, the listener, turn your dreams and ideas into reality. One of the ways we do that, of course, is through this podcast, but we do so much more. We have a half-day and full-day workshop on building your own website, some free guides you can download, like Overcoming the Unknown and How to Know When You Found Your Dream, or even the Dreamer's Guide to Micro Experiments. You can find that at jumblethink.com slash guides. You can also start the conversation about having us help you walk through the process of turning that dream and idea that you've been sitting on forever into reality. So drop us an email. Let us know your story. Let us know how we can help you. Hello at jumblethink.com. Now let's return to our conversation with Mark Geiger. We are back with Mark Geiger, and we're going to go a little bit deeper into the world of luthier uh, industry and and so much more before we get going how can people find and connect with you i i actually just got rid of my website because nobody ever looks at them anymore the best way to do it would be through facebook i have a public page called geiger guitars and we'll make sure to uh, have a link to that in the episode notes so if you want to check it out it'll be real easy to find just click it right there okay so one of the real unique things about artisan luthiers uh, versus the big box Taylor, Martin, Gibson. And there's nothing wrong with Taylors or Martins or nope. Gibson. They're just a different <laughs> thing. Um, you get to collaborate in the building process. Yes, you are the artist in what you're building. You are the, the craftsman. 
but you're able to work and collaborate with uh, your customer, whereas uh, that's very rare to happen with a Taylor guitar or your, um, uh, yeah, it, it's just not worth it usually at that level to work with Taylor. So tell us a little bit about your approach uh, for being able to work one-on-one and how that collaboration looks when somebody comes in and says, sure. hey, I want you to build a guitar. Well, what I like to do is I like to find out what they're playing at the time. So, and normally, uh, you know, it's one of those things. I never, like, you never talk anybody into buying one of these. Yeah. Usually what happens is that they played them before. Yeah. And they liked either the sound or the playability or whatever. Um, you're never going to let go hard sell any of this stuff. Yeah. And so what I try to do is I try to sit down with them, find out what their style is, how they like to play, listen to them play too, which is a good thing. Mm. And what I usually do, they'll usually have some pretty good ideas of what they want. Um, I just finished an instrument for a woman. We did it out of Makassar Ebony, which is just a stunning piece of wood. And um, she was a big fan of, uh, of a certain flower she grew up with. And so that's what we did for an inlay. So it's a question of woods, matching the woods together. So the top wood uh, is usually spruce matching that with the back to try to get a sound she's interested in, in in that case and that sort of thing. And then after we get that basic stuff done, then it's all the little details, you know, what color purflings do you want? Do you, you know, um, (laughs) what sorts of little odds and ends do you like? Do you want inlays on the fretboard? Do you want a black? Do you want what kind of scale is going to be, which is pretty important too. The longer the scale, usually the more figure style players like it. But if you've got small hands, that may not work for you. So you kind of deal with it in that respect. So the the cool part about it is, is actually going through the process. And at the end of the thing, what I do is I always document everything. And at the end, when the person takes the delivery of it, I usually have a book. Okay. So they can go through the book and look through, you know, how, how I built it and how their particular instrument was built. Wow. Wow, that's really, really cool. You know, so much goes into playing guitar. I've played guitar since I was... 12 something like that uh and now i'm 37 so i i have a taylor guitar i have a the classic uh gibson acoustic guitar from the the 60s mm-hmm. uh and yet uh, i go to these artisan shows i was just at one this spring and uh it, there's just things that you don't see uh in the taylors uh and some of that is creeping in uh the armrests the way they are the yeah. certain kinds of uh like half cutouts where you're leaving the side and back but you're just notching it out uh you know you get to a lot of freedom to innovate and do things and try things where uh these big companies they're just trying to pump out guitars that that their customers want that uh, meet certain pr- criteria. So for you, when you're seeing new innovations or when you're thinking through an idea, how do you process like, hey, maybe this is something I should do or uh, that's really cool. I wonder how they did it. How do you process through solving those questions for yourself? Well, a lot of it too is is that the guitar community is pretty small. Yeah. So whenever we meet at these, like the Healdsburg Festival, which is no longer extant, um, that's, that's over and done, which is really a shame. Yeah. Yeah. But you talk to all these people and everybody sorts of like, oh, look at that. Look at that. And they'll go through and they'll pick out things they like. And that's how all this innovation starts. It usually starts from somebody looking at something and going, well, I'd like that, but I think I could do that a little differently. Mm. And so that's where that comes from. <coughs> Excuse me. But one of the things I, I, I like, for instance, if, if a supplier has all this beautiful uh, waterfall sapelli, which yeah. is a, a, a kind of a hardwood from Malaysia. Uh, the next time you see a big show, everybody will have a guitar made out of that wood. So in that respect, it's sort of like that. Uh, everybody sort of follows this, but they also innovate it as well. Like I've done armrests and, and sound ports and stuff like that. And it's kind of interesting um, to try all that stuff. And then you end up making it your own. Um when I was when I started out, there were no guitar schools. Um, right, right. And, and so it was basically just the seat of your pants. I think that has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the disadvantages is it takes you a lot longer to get good at it. Yeah, you're not you, you're not getting anything, you know, from somebody else. The plus side to it is is you get a little bit more of your own style. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing you were talking about with the tailors. 
like you said, there's nothing wrong with them. If you like a Taylor and a float your boat, that's great. I, I'm not yeah. trying to talk you out of it. Um, Taylor starts out with 100 tops and 100 backs and sides, and they make 100 guitars. Yeah. I'll go through 100 tops and 100 backs and sides and pick out two or three. Right. And that's that's kind of the main difference, aside from the detail, is I'm trying to hear that, you know, what do I want to do with that particular set of wood? Yeah. So, well, let's talk a little bit about wood because there are multiple layers to that. Uh, a couple years ago, Gibson got in a little bit of trouble uh, because of CITES or uh, the Lacey Act, or there are different acts in the environmental space that impact this. I'm sure that's changed your philosophy on what you're building out of and how you're building. Talk to us a little bit about uh, people think that these craftsmen, whether they're at the level of a tailor and a big corporation or whether they're a smaller boutique shop uh, with one builder, uh, there's misconceptions. I mean, everyone I've talked to in this space is super uh, valuing the environment and that kind of thing. So tell us how the the changes environmental policies have impacted building. Well, I think for the bigger companies, it's a, it's a lot bigger deal than it is for me. I mean, they're talking about, you know, they'll import a thousand fretboards at one time. Right. And, you know, I, I typically, you know, 12 guitars a year for me, is that's a big deal in between teaching. So I, I, I think that for me, I've got a stock of what I've had for a long time. But I also maintain that um, that I try to be very careful about what I pick. Um, some of the Brazilian rosewood I've used has all been cut from stumps that are dead trees. Yeah. <clears throat> so that really has no impact on the environment at all. The trees are already cut down. The other thing is I use so little of it that yeah. uh, um, that, that I, you know, we're not talking about a big veneer company that's making, you know, ebony doors that, you know, that, that goes through millions of dollars worth of veneer. So that part of it, um, you know, I try to just be careful and make sure I don't waste any of it. Yeah. The other, the other thing is, is that like it used to be that you used to cut. And I think Bob Taylor said this: you'd cut down four ebony trees to find one that had black ebony to use for the fretboards, and the other stuff would have brown stripes in it, and they throw it away. And what he's tried to do is, well, let's use them; they're just as good, yeah. and it's pretty. Yeah. And yeah. I, I totally agree with that. So I, I actually like a lot of those so-called flaws. Yeah. <clears throat> And I think that that's one of the uh, evolutions that I've seen. If you look at a classic or vintage Martin or Gibson from the turn of the century, what you're seeing from wood selection is significantly different than what's being used today. You see a lot more figure now, a lot more inconsistencies of, of guitar because uh, the wood is just stunning that's available that was being thrown out back then. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's a type of spruce called bear claw, <clears throat> which yeah. actually looks like – a bear clawed it um and that used to be thrown out and now it's a premium uh, the other thing is is that the only brazilian rosewood anybody ever used was this really straight grain stuff that typically didn't have a lot of action and now we're using all that and a lot of people thought that that was pretty uh well it won't be stable it won't be this well I, i've got a guitar here out of brazilian that's cut from the stump that's really wild grained i've had it for 12 years and i don't see any movement on it at all it depends on how you take care of it so, you know, I, I think it's – they call this the golden age of Luthery, and I think that's probably true. There's better stuff being built now than there ever was, and I'll even say that to be the case with old Martins. <clears throat> I think the quality of the craftsmanship is right up there with anything that's ever been made. I'd have to agree. I've played with uh, so many different guitars from different luthiers, and, and, and there's a real – honor in the community between builders and also collaboration in which the builders are uh, really encouraging each other to do well. I, like you're teaching other people and, and there isn't this, hey, I've got all this knowledge, I'm going to hoard it. You just don't see that that often in the community. So for you, as, you, uh, as you're teaching, uh, how has that taught you about building? Because often we think about, oh, this is the master teaching the student, but I'm sure you've learned and evolved through that process too. So what have you learned by being a teacher? Well, the it, most interesting part is it's actually streamlined my process. Okay. I've, I've got to get a guitar built from start to finish without the finish. We don't have time to do that, but, you know, strung up and playable in two weeks. And so for me to do that, I've got to be able to have my – 
my process down to the point where we don't have any downtime. <clears throat> yeah. You know, if we're waiting for a neck to glue up, we're doing something else. And so in that case, it's actually made my process more thoughtful. <clears throat> when I build a guitar, I'm quicker than I ever was because I'm using the same techniques I'm teaching with. So in that case, it's actually helped quite a bit. Um, a lot of my stuff will take a little longer because I'm doing a lot more complicated things. You know, right. an armrest, a sound port, inlays, purflings that, you know, I'm mitering these purflings. So if you look at the side, it comes around and then chases itself around with with miters. And that sort of stuff takes time. Um, but even that's quicker because of the fact that I have this other process. Um, when I glue up my braces, I have a vacuum pump and a bladder. So yeah. I can glue up all these braces at once where it used to take me a lot longer with a go-bar deck. A go-bar deck is basically just two pieces of wood with a, a bar in the middle that's a little longer and it creates pressure. Um, whereas the vacuum pump, I can do a uh, top and a back in one day. So that kind of stuff is how the teaching you know, works for me. And the other thing, and the main reason why I like the teaching well, two reasons. Number one, as you get older, you know, you, your body starts to wear out. When I'm teaching, I don't have to do as much physical work as I would if I was building. So that's part of it. <laughs> yeah. the, but the other thing is, is that um, when I'm teaching, I get a kick out of it. I, it's almost like you're building a guitar for the first time because you're watching these guys go through this process. And how I teach is I will show them. I'll tell them first and then I'll show them. And then I'll let them go ahead and experience it. And that way they get to see how I do it. And, and, and some of the things like I work with pretty, pretty old fashioned tools. I don't have a joiner in my shop. I have a, a, a joiner plane, which is this 24 inch monster <clears throat> that's really old school. And I find it works better. I take yeah. less space. And so teaching people how to do that is kind of interesting to me. Also, I, I love the sound of it. You're going through this wood and you can hear the shh and you're cutting these paper thin little shavings off. And, and I find that to be appealing too. Super, super cool. Now, innovation on how things are being built and teaching, that's changed over the years, but also the music industry is, is rapidly changing. I, I saw a post of yours just talking about how the landscape has even changed uh, since 2008, 2009 with the recession. How has that impacted you and how are you navigating uh, the change of the musical industry as we know it, how people buy and sell instruments? Well, I think for one thing, um, I got into this about 10 years ago teaching. And I think that's actually helped quite a bit because the guitar market just isn't quite what it was for a couple of reasons. I think the economy, nobody needs a $10,000 guitar. And so if I'm building something like that and that's all I'm going to build, I may find that I'm having a really hard time cutting it in the market when the teaching sort of supplements that. So it has that impact as well. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is, is that um, I've read that people aren't playing guitar as much. Okay. Um, you know, uh, the music industry has moved away. There are no big record companies anymore. And so, you know, you've heard like Guitar Hero and all these, you know, things like that. And I had a nephew who said, oh, you've got to try this. You can, and I couldn't do it because I'm playing behind the note. When the yeah. Note comes up, yeah. So if you really play guitar, you can't do it. So that right. part of it's kind of funny, too. But I, I do think that it'll come around again. I think it usually does. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's uh, really interesting how um, online has also impacted visibility. Uh, have you seen that for you where Facebook and other channels have helped support people being able to see you and, and know that you exist and do what you're doing? Oh, yeah. I think things like Facebook and Instagram, I mean, that's my primary way of, of getting around now. <clears throat> I also have um, – there are different guitar supp wood suppliers and part suppliers – and I'm on their list. So if people look for uh, luthier schools, they'll find me on there. And I think that helps. Like Stuart McDonald, um, that sort of thing. They, that's a, a guitar supply. You know, they have tools and parts and stuff. And so a lot of people, if they want to look for me, will look for a guitar school there. The other thing I do too differently is when I teach, I'm one-on-one. -on -one. And a lot of these guitar schools will be like eight people at once. And I think that's yeah. a, a – it's – better for the student they get a little bit more personal 
Absolutely. One of the things you said in the first uh, segment that just stuck, uh, stuck with me now is uh, we have moved into a society where nobody really builds things anymore. Uh, what, what do you think we can be doing as creatives, as people who see the possibilities? What can we be doing to return to uh, or influence culture to really start building things? Uh, one story I like to tell, uh, I've never ch- shared it on this podcast, which is kind of funny, but uh, I was over in Asia one time uh, doing some work with a, a nonprofit organization. I was talking to someone about consumerism, and we're just comparing America against Asia. He was from the States, and he said, you know what's interesting is Americans like to buy cheap stuff that they can consume and, and uh, uh, discard. He goes, where we're at, we buy things from America that have been handcrafted, furniture, things like that, that last for generations. Uh, and so there's this philosophy shift that we obviously somewhere in America, somewhere along the line made. How can we change that? How can we impact that narrative and get people back to quality things that are going to last the t- uh, test of time and really have an impact uh, in individual lives instead of being mass produced? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's interesting. I get people, <clears throat> I've had people come up to me constantly when I've had guitars in shops and I've been there. How come your guitars are so expensive? And I think there's this Walmart sort of mentality that, um, you know, it's almost like they magically appear and they're going to appear cheap. Right. And I, 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 I don't know. I think that's, that's a really tough question because I'd like to be able to find out how to do that myself. I mean, I think one of the things is, is by teaching people how to do this, they get a better appreciation for it. Um, I've had some students come up to me. I couldn't understand how come a guitar was worth 300 bucks. Now I understand why they cost 5,000 for a really high end one. So I think that's part of it. Plus everybody who does something like this is going to keep, you, you, it's kind of like um, you hope it branches out. One person's right. going to tell two or three people and they're going to tell two or three people. And I think that kind of helps a little bit too. My wife and I have this joke about who would you want on your apocalypse team? <laughs> if, if, the um, proverbial hit the fan. Who are yeah. you going to have? Who, who would your friends be? I mean, would it be a doctor? Or, you know, would it be um, somebody who could build something or whatever? And and I, you know, we're being facetious, but I think it's it's kind of true. You know, yeah. That, that I, I I sort of value certain things that I think a lot of other people don't. Um, I like to work on a whole bunch of different things. I like to work on watches. So I'll take watches apart and glue them and put them up together. And and I think everything I do like that helps my guitar building. <clears throat> but in terms of the only thing I think I could do is just explain to people. You know, if somebody comes up to me and says, how come your guitar is expensive? You don't sit there and go, well, if you don't know, I'm not going to tell you. You try to actually explain to them why. And it yeah. might not affect you know, half the people you talk to, but there's going to be half of them go, oh, okay, now I understand. And so I think that might be one route to do that. <clears throat> yeah, more awareness, more conversations, a little bit more seeing behind. Uh, you know, sometimes when people are craftsmen and artisans, they like to, to kind of keep the magic there uh, of mystery. And, and I think that in the society with information being so prevalent uh we can see behind the curtain and see the realities that hey building a guitar isn't an a quick and easy process uh when you're doing it at a high level uh and you're not mass producing them uh with with chief materials it's it's just the reality of the the what you're building it, it's something that has value yeah I, I, i'd like to i'd like to think it does the other thing i'd like to do is go the other way too and actually say it's difficult and there are things you have to know how to do. On the other hand, it's not rocket science. Right. And and that's one of the things I love to, to do about teaching it or explaining it to somebody. If you explain it to somebody why it costs a lot of money, then they go, oh, okay. If I'm going to buy a set of Brazilian rosewood somebody wants, it's going to cost me $3,000 for this yeah. back and sides. It's raw piece of wood. And I think the more people understand that, the better that is. Okay, so as we wrap up this segment – Uh, I have a couple quick questions for you before we go into our final segment, which is rapid fire questions. Uh, These are a little bit more about you specifically uh, and less a little broad, like our rapid fire questions. So the first question is favorite woods to build with. Uh, Macassar ebony and uh, European spruce for the tops. Okay. Uh, You are a car guy. We were talking a little bit about that in one of the breaks here. I uh, resonate with your love of Porsches. 
What's your favorite car? My favorite car. You're going to think this is kind of funny, but my favorite car is actually an Aston Martin. <laughs> okay. Which one? <clears throat> I actually like the Vantage. Okay. And okay. I've driven a few of those. It's kind of fun. Nice. The reason why I like them is they're very analog. They yeah. still have manual transmissions. They still have hydraulic steering. They have all this stuff that I like. A car that doesn't have a lot of uh, interference. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So for you, uh, as you're building uh, and you're selecting the, the woods and working with the customers and teaching, what is the biggest thing that you wish that people knew more of about your industry? Well, I think it's some of the things we talked about. I, I wish they would understand that, um, people have to make a living. If I'm going to a plumber or an electrician, I'm not going to say, well, how come you're charging $75 an hour or, or the lawyer, you know, the, one of them we know charges $400 an hour. They have to make a living and I should be able to too. So I still think that if somebody comes in and tries to, you know, go, well, no, that's too expensive. Can you do it for this? I think that's disrespectful. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we'll be back with Mark Geiger and going into our final segment where we ask rapid fire questions. Hey there, I have a huge favor to ask. Are you enjoying today's episode? Or maybe you have a favorite episode of the Jumble Think podcast. Would you share it? Share it with a friend, a coworker, a family member, someone you know who would love the Jumble Think podcast. Or maybe share it on your favorite social media channel like Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. We love doing this podcast, but we want to get the word out to more and more people so that they know that they were created for purpose, just like you were, and that there are amazing entrepreneurs chasing their dreams, and you can do it too. So all I need you to do is share one episode with somebody or somewhere to let people know about the Jumble Think podcast and how it's impacted you. Now let's return for our rapid fire questions with Mark Geiger. We are back with Mark Geiger for rapid fire questions. Mark, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. So the first question is, what is one tip you'd give someone with a big idea or dream and they don't know where to start? Well, I think the best thing to do is to try to research it as much as possible and then just go ahead and do it. You're going to make mistakes. Just keep doing it until you get it right. What is one change you would like to see in the world? I think we're becoming too much like the Eloy and the Morlocks from H.G. Wells and the Time Machine, and I wish that would change a little bit. We could open up conversation without everybody getting mad at everybody else. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, that would be uh, much needed right now, to say the least. What do you want your legacy to be? I, I think the instruments I build. I'm hoping they're going to be around for 100 years. So yeah. that's kind of what I think. Where do you find inspiration? I find it pretty much in everything. I like to build stuff. And I don't care whether it's repairing a watch or making a hat or doing whatever. It kind of gives you this sort of revitalization. You're exploring these things and researching them. And I think that's the cool part. What is one book that you think every dreamer or entrepreneur should read and why? You know, I, I thought about this. And most of what I read is fiction. And I okay. read a lot of it. But I think people like Margaret Atwood, and this is way before all these, you know, now she's kind of the, the author du jour, but I've been reading her for 30 years, and I love stuff like that. That inspires me because that gives me a perspective on humanity. I love it. How do you define success? Uh, I define it by how, how well you enjoy your job. Okay. I like that. I, that is a, you know, we get a lot of responses to these questions and sometimes you go, oh, I've heard that one before, but I like that one because I haven't heard it before. And I think that's a great definition of success. What is one habit you find helpful in your life as an entrepreneur? Perseverance. If you work for yourself, you have to be self-motivated. There are days when you don't want to do anything and you just have to get up and go do it. Yeah. How do you start and finish your day? Uh, a big cup of coffee. <laughs> and usually, <laughs> usually what I do is my wife and I usually take a long walk. Um, usually I live about a mile from the ocean. So a lot of times we'll take a three mile walk on the ocean. Now, when you were remodeling your house and you were sharing some of those posts on social, uh, I was getting pretty jealous. So I won't <laughs> lie. Seeing some of those posts on your walks and your adventures, I was like, 
Dude, Mark's living a pretty awesome life. It seems like he's got a, a really happy life going on. Well, you know, part of it's luck, but I think also part of it is just you got to stick with it. <laughs> if you weren't doing what you're to, uh, doing today, what do you think you'd be doing? I think, like I said, I'd be building something. Yeah. I'd be off doing something like that. What is one dream you are still wanting to fulfill in your own life? Hmm. I think I want that Aston Martin. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a good one. As we wrap up today's episode, what is the final thought you want to leave all of us with? I think people should get out and do things. I think we edit ourselves too much. And I think it's a little bit like writing a book or whatever. You should just go write the first draft. Yeah. And I think that's what people should do. They should get out and do it and not worry about what somebody's going to think and not worry about failing. It's, it'll, it's a cliche, but if you don't do anything, you're not going to fail. Yeah. So, so good. Mark, uh, I, I've been a big fan of yours for years. It's a privilege to have you on. You. I'm looking forward to coming out and seeing you uh, hopefully soon and do your class and actually finish the guitar I've been working on and for 10 time. years. Uh, and so thanks so much for taking time and being with us today. Well, thank you for having me. Once again, we want to thank today's guest, Mark Geiger, for taking time out to share his story of his adventures in Hollywood, making guitars, and so much more. We also want to thank today's sponsor, OpportunityInChina.com. Make sure you check out what they're doing at OpportunityInChina.com. As we wrap up today's episode, I want to encourage you, get out there and chase your dreams and ideas. You were created for purpose. You were created for something significant. The world needs you. So do something, whether it's a small step, a big step, or just a conversation. But do something to move those dreams and ideas from dreams and ideas and into reality. Cherchez la meilleure position. Les bras et les jambes légèrement espacés. Tirez-vous doucement, mais complètement. En avant, en arrière, sur les côtés. Vous êtes une autre personne. Les mères de famille, les enfants, peuvent également prendre un moment revitalisant. Dans quelques mois, Lorsque vous aurez bien saisi la technique et que vous serez maître de votre corps, vous pourrez vous décontracter même en travaillant.